afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining today's um, virtual Meet the Pathology Careers Talks. Um, my name is Tacha, and um, I'm the Communications Officer at the Royal College of Pathologists. Um, today, I'm joined by Penny Fletcher, who's the Public Engagement Manager, and the two of us will be working behind the scenes um, during the webinar. Um, today, we'll be hearing from three pathologists, um, Dr. Alex Wilshire, Dr. Hamad Sharaf, and Dr. Zoe Rivers. Um, if you do have any questions for our pathologists today, please do add them to the Q&A section of the webinar, which you'll see at the bottom of the screen. Um, we'll do our best to answer as many of the questions as possible after we've heard from all three pathologists. Um, before we hear from Alex, Hamad, and um, Zoe, we'd like to give you a bit of background information um, so as I mentioned, we're from the Royal College of Pathologists. Um, yeah. And this week we're celebrating National Pathology Week. Um, and our theme for this year is All Together Now. So um, we're looking at how pathologists work together within um, the 17 pathology specialties. And also we're, we're looking at how pathologists work with other healthcare professionals um, to diagnose and treat patients. Um, if you've not heard of pathology before, um, you might be wondering what it is. Um, so we've got a very short animation that we'd like to show you. Um, it's just a minute long. And I'll play that for you now. Pathologists are experts in disease. Their job is to work out what is making someone unwell, advise on their treatment, and stop other people getting ill the same way. Pathologists work in laboratories, in clinics, and on hospital wards. Every blood test, allergy diagnosis, or search for infection will involve a pathology team. People who work in pathology services specialise in particular areas. For example, if you're anemic, a haematologist will find out why. When you find a lump, a histopathologist will work out if you have cancer or not. If you have diabetes, a chemical pathologist will plan your treatment. And when you've got an infection, a microbiologist will advise whether or not you need antibiotics, and if so, which one. Bridging science and medicine, pathologists underpin every aspect of patient care. Diagnosing, treating and preventing disease, they are a key part of the healthcare team. Pathology. Um, so I hope that um, helped helped you understand a little bit more about what pathology is and what pathologists do. Um, we do have several other virtual um, careers talks happening all throughout November. Um, so they are on Wednesdays and Fridays, um, and there will be various pathologists from across the different specialties um, talking at these. So please do um, sign up to join some of the other um, careers talks. Um, and if you'd like to find out a bit more about what we do um, at the Royal College of Pathologists um, and about careers in pathology, um, you can check out our website, which is um, rcpath.org forward slash careers. Um, you can also follow us on our social media channels. Um, so we're on, we are on Twitter, Facebook, um, and Instagram. Instagram in particular, um, uh, is, is aimed at uh, students and, and uh, undergraduates and trainees, so um, um, please do have a look at that. Um, and we've also got lots of other videos um, that you can check out on our YouTube channel, um, and we'll be sending these links around after um, this event. So I'll just stop sharing. And um, we'll kick off today's um, careers talks with um, Dr. Alex Walsh, um, who'll be telling us a bit about uh, what she does. Um, and again, if you have any questions, please do add them to the Q&A section and um, we'll answer them after all three talks. Thank you. I'll hand over to Alex. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. So bear with me while I just start my session. Here we go. Right, so 
hopefully you'll find what I say is interesting. If you don't, there's lots of pictures, which I hope you'll also find interesting. So as Thad has already said, my name is Dr. Alex Walsher. I'm a pathology doctor in training. And what that means is I did A-levels at school, like some, some of you may be. I then went to medical school for six years, did some general training, which all new doctors have to do, and then chose to specialise in pathology or histopathology or cellular pathology or other names for it. And now what is pathology? You already saw from that animation. It's kind of the nuts and bolts of how our body works. And if we can understand how it works in health, when everything is going right, we can work out what's happening in disease or when things aren't going so well. In our particular thing, in the, in the animation it talked about lumps, we use tissue. And what, what I mean by that, a selection of, of cells organized, so the kind of building blocks in our body with a set function. So that might be skin, for instance, and a biopsy, something you might have heard of. That's often what we use to help us answer the questions the other doctors might have to help the patient. Okay, so to start with, I wanted to talk about pathology as a science, because I think that's what most people think. We, we work in the lab, and, and that's true to an extent, but a lot of our work happens in an office with, with one of these, which is a light microscope. Now, in some parts of the country, they're starting to use computers more, but certainly where I work at the moment, this remains the kind of bread and butter. And, and what happens is we take very thin sections, very, very thin sections of tissue and wax that gets put onto a glass slide so that the light can shine through. And we have a look at it on here. And this is probably one of the most important parts of our microscope. It's called an objective lens, but it's really a magnifying glass. And that's important because it allows us to zoom in. And one of the most important skills of a pathologist is being methodical, so working in a systematic way through steps, but also having attention to detail. So we might look at something on a four times, for instance, so that's zoomed in four times. Some people call that helicopter view, and that allows you to have a look at all of, at all of the tissue. Um, now, we couldn't look at everything on a times 40 because that's zoomed in 40 times. But with the attention to detail that you have, you can pick out the areas that don't look quite right, zoom in and have a look, and that will help you when you give your answers to the other doctors. Now that is another part, very important part of our day. There are lots of different ways in which we can communicate to the doctors that have requested these tests for the patients. One of the ways is through a report, which we'll write often on, on a computer. Another way is through meetings with lots of different doctors, some of which might be looking at scans and they can use all that information together to work out what the best treatment is for the patient. And we also may have discussions over the phone as well or, or in person about things to help in more detail. Okay, so now thinking about pathology as an art. Now, I, I'm not sure that people will think of it this way, but actually I think it's one of the most important parts of pathology is being able to take the information, the visual information that you see under the microscope and put that into words that will help ultimately the patient. I'm, I'm no artist, but this is a famous painting by Gustav Klimt on the, on the left. And on the right is an image of a microscope slide of somebody's large bowel. And I hope to convince you that number one is, is an oval shape with quite a, a deep color and it's the same color throughout, which looks similar, I think, to number four, which is a cell. The cytoplasm of the cell is all one colour. But then if we look at number two, which is another oval shape within that larger oval shape, looks somewhat like number five, which is, which is, is the nucleus. It has slightly different colours. It's, it's not all the same colour, we would say. It's got different tones and different, different contrast. And number three is pointing to this little circular dot within that, which I think looks a little bit like there's some very deep concentrated color dots within these nucleus, which is the nucleolus. And what I'm hoping to show is that that visual information is so important. And if we can describe that and put that into writing, that will help our other colleagues. And then lastly, 
I promise this is relevant. I used to love Harry Potter when I was at school. You may not have grown up with the books, you might have grown up with the films perhaps, but thinking about patterns, I think this is a really iconic thing that everybody might recognise. And that's a large part of our job is recognising patterns, recognising when things are right so that we can recognise when they're not right. But also I think reading in particular is something that you might not think about the skills required to do that to concentrate, to think systematically, but also imagination, like I spoke about with taking what you see and putting it into words, I think is so important. So I, I think that is me. I hope that was interesting. If you have any questions, please pop it in the chat and I'll hand over to the next person. Thanks so much, Alex. That was really interesting to hear about the overlap between art, the arts and creativity um, and that, how that ties into um, to pathology as well, and how, it's, how it's relevant. Um, so we're now going to hear from um, Dr. Zoe Rivers. Hello there, my name is Zoe Rivers and I'm a histopathologist in training. Today, I'm going to talk you through one part of my job, the skills involved in that. And at the end, I'm going to show you how this knitted toy relates to the job that I do. When someone tells you that they've had an operation, this is probably the image that comes to your mind. But have you ever thought about what happens to the part of the body that's been taken out during the operation? A histopathologist plays a major role in finding out the reason why a person has become unwell. In this picture, my children are pretending to take out an appendix as scans have shown that it is swollen or inflamed. Let's follow the appendix on its journey through the laboratory to find out how a histopathologist can help. This is a model of an appendix. The appendix is a worm shaped structure that's attached to the first part of the intestines. Its function is largely unknown. Sometimes it gets inflamed and this is known as appendicitis. We don't amiss our appendix if it's removed. In the operating theatre, after the surgeon has removed the appendix, it is placed into a specimen pot and a form is completed to explain the patient's symptoms. On arrival to the laboratory, the specimen is booked in and the pot and the form are labelled with a number that is unique to that particular patient. It is essential that this number is checked at every stage in the appendix's journey to make sure that no errors occur. After carefully checking the details, the histopathologist removes the appendix and measures its length and diameter, and then describes the appearance. We use pattern recognition to pick out features that look different to what we would normally expect. We then carefully slice the appendix in a set logical way. After this, we lay out the slices and carefully examine them. We then select the pieces that we would like to investigate in more detail under a microscope. Again, we use pattern recognition to pick out any features that are unusual. In this case, we would be interested in looking at this area with the pale nodule. The pieces of interest are then placed into a cassette, which is about the size of a large postage stamp. Again, this cassette is labelled with the same unique patient number and has to be carefully checked. Biomedical scientists then take the cassette and use a special machine called a microtome to take very thin slices of the appendix pieces. They then stick them onto a slide and then stain these pieces with special pink and purple stains. After this, the histopathologist is given the slide and the form, and again, we carefully check that the details match. We then place the slide under a microscope. This is the sort of image that we might see. Again, at this stage, we're using pattern recognition to spot any changes that we think look different to normal, and we use our medical knowledge to establish if this may be the cause of the patient's symptoms. After this, we write a report describing what we have seen under the microscope and piece all of the information together to reach a diagnosis. This report is then sent to the doctor who's looking after the patient. As you can see, we use a wide range of skills in our job. We have a logical approach, pay great attention to detail. We use pattern recognition to identify any areas that might look different to what we'd expect. 
We piece all of the information together to problem solve. We work amongst a great team of people and we use good written and verbal communication skills. Outside of work, I have lots of hobbies and interests. I enjoy spending time with my children, photography, knitting, teaching primary school children how their bodies work, writing books, and organizing picture trails for our local children in our village. All of these interests use a range of skills, many of which I use in my day-to-day -day job. This takes me back to my knitted character. This corgi I've recently made for a trail that I'm doing next year for the Queen's Jubilee. It's made out of three different colored wools. It's got red, oh, it's got plastic eyes and a nose, and it's made of lots of pieces that I had to join together. When making this uh, dog, I used many of the skills that I use in my job. Again, I had to have a logical approach and great attention to detail. I used a pattern to make it and stitch it together. And if I made an error in the, in the knitting, then I had to work out what I'd done wrong and solve the problem. Do you have any hobbies that you think that use the skills that I've described today? Thank you. Thanks so much, Zoe. Um, really great to hear about your um, all the different skills that you've used in um, creating your knitted corgi, which is very impressive, um, and how that links into your job as well. Um, just a reminder that if you've got any questions for any of our pathologists, please do pop them in the Q&A section. Um, we'll be getting, um, we'll go over to the, um, the Q&A portion of this uh, webinar after the next talk. Um, so yeah, please pop them in there. The next talk is by Dr. Hamad Shara. Hi everyone, um, my name is Hannah Charoff, I'm um, a trainee in infection, um, which may be um, a new term that you haven't heard before, and that's because it's like a, an evolving specialty, which um, is partly pathology and partly clinical, um, so I'm a microbiologist and at the same time I train in infectious disease as well. And I'll just give you a bit of a hint about what I would do in, in like a day in, in my life, really. So when I say that I work as an infection doctor, the first thing that comes to people's mind usually is that. Um, and what you can see there is um, myself and some of my colleagues wearing um, some protective equipment. Um, and these are quite important sometimes um, in, in some of the infections we deal with. Um, because some of it might be um, very um, um, easy to spread um, and it could have some consequences to our health if we actually um, become infected um, with these. So we need to take all the possible um, precautions in order to avoid that so we can continue to look after our patients. Um, and for instance, like that happened at the start of the pandemic with, um, with COVID. So we were wearing these initially um, quite frequently to protect us um, until we understood more about um, COVID-19 infection. And also some people think that I maybe spend um, my time in the lab um, and actually um, I do. Um, so part of my work would be in the lab. Um, I might not be processing samples as such um, because my work is more clinical, so I deal with the results that come from the lab and that the um, other doctor colleagues will be interested in, and I helping interpret, help them interpreting these results um, in a way which would help the patients. Some even think I'm like this man. I'm not sure if you've seen um, this series before, but it was um, quite popular, um, and you might Google it. Um, his name is Dr. House. Um, and he's an infection specialist. And although a lot of what they do um, in this series is not actually true, um, but um, some people still think that this is what an infection doctor is like. What I think I do is that I'm um, a link. I'm a link between a clinician and the patient sometimes. Um, and I link them both to the lab. I feel myself like the person who puts the pieces of the puzzle together. 
Um, so if a patient has got an infection, I have the knowledge um, and the expertise to know what is the best way to treat this patient. I can either treat them myself um, when I'm doing my um, work on the wards, or I could help um, just by um, giving advice to my colleagues about how to best um, manage these infections. Um, and yeah, I think it's quite interesting because we, you know, we face all different sorts of infections all the time. And I think, as I mentioned earlier, the, the, pan, the COVID pandemic was um, quite an eye opener um, to actually what our role is um, within the community. So my ultimate goal um, and what I look forward to is to see all my patients get better. And luckily with most infections, that is the case. Um, and that's one exciting thing about my job is that most of the time I would see my patients being cured and they'll be back home to their friends and families um, safe and sound. So this is um, what we all hope for. And actually, although it might be strange, but I feel when I'm at my work is as, is as interesting as what I like to do outside of work, which is um, gaming. Um, so I'm a big fan of PlayStation 4. I'm not sure about if you heard about the hit, The Last of Us. Um, and I've played that quite a lot. And actually, when I play a role playing game, I feel like it, it, it kind of shares some of the skills that you need um, in my line of work. Um, so it's, it's the um, attention to detail, always looking for clues, um, trying and trying and trying. Um, so you can actually achieve um, what you want. Um, and then in the end, you just, you know, get your prize, which whatever it is. Um, and in my, although in my clinical work, it's, um, it, it is a kind of seeing my patients getting better. Um, but um, in a game, it might be just the suspicion that you've kind of completed uh, the task you've been given. Um, so I actually enjoy it quite a lot. And I still game despite uh, the fact that uh, I'm a busy doctor, but I always find time. And what made me interested? So this is a bit personal for myself. So this man in the picture is actually my grandfather. And I didn't actually get to spend much time with him because um, when I was five, he passed away. And he passed away as a result of a, an infection, um, which is by a virus called hepatitis C virus. And this virus, at the time um, was um, incurable. Um, but actually nowadays we have a treatment for this virus and we've achieving cure rates of over 95%. So that shows how important our job is because it's not only that we treat patients, but we also discover new treatments that will help us and help our families and friends um, to be better and be there for us um, for a long time. And usually in any talk I give, um, I always talk about washing hands because I think this is, if, if anything we can do and we can learn and take off from any um, um, situation that we deal with is that washing hands actually save lives. Um, the picture on the left hand side, this is a, a plate, um, it's a culture plate. This is where we grow different or like bacteria and um, fungi. Um, and, and basically this, this shows if you put your hand on the plate, what we may grow in the lab. So you can imagine we're all surrounded by bacteria all the time. And the simple way to protect ourselves and, and the people we get in contact with is by washing hands. And again, I think COVID-19 has clearly showed the benefit um, of doing that regularly and more, and more often than we would normally do. That's the end of my talk. Thank you very much for listening and hope it was helpful. Thank you, Hannah. That was brilliant. Um, yeah, really great to hear about your the inspiration um, behind why why you became a pathologist, um, and also yeah, very very important message about um, washing hands. As you mentioned, something that we've definitely learned a lot more about during the pandemic. Um, but really interesting to see that um, that image of the, the petri dish with the, the handprint as well. Um, so we hope that you've. Um, You've learned a lot from the three talks. Um, we're going to move on to the Q&A section. So please do continue to add your questions into the Q&A section of the webinar. Um, 
So I'm going to open up with um, the first question, um, which is one from one of our attendees who says, um, hi, I'm someone who wants to pursue a career with researching the human body or diseases, but I'm not sure what I want to specialize in just yet. Um, are there any degrees or pathways that you recommend that offer a broad range of science knowledge so I could make my decision later? Would any of you like to answer that or have any ideas about what sorts of um, degrees? Medicine's quite a, a broad one, um, as well as it to start. Um, do, you want to, do you want to say something a little bit about the um, medical degrees you did and how you went on to choose your specialties? Um, I actually started um, out after school as a medical technical officer working in neurophysiology um, and it was only in later life that I decided to go to medical school. Um, so I attended <coughs> school about the age of 27 and obviously went through the five years of medical school, did my training um, as a foundation doctor and then chose histopathology beyond that because I just found it fascinating so medicine does offer a very wide range of things but just to say you can get into medicine later in life and choose one course and then go on to do something else later on. Thank you Sari. Um, Alex or Hamid did you want to add anything to that? And um, also just to say that um, that you can go down um, research careers once you've finished medicine as well. Um, and also um, some, um, some of the professionals who work within pathology, um, they actually start off doing biomedical science as a degree. Um, and again, there are various routes once you finish your, your degree from that. So both of those pathways, they um, allow a lot of um, variation later on in, in your career. So if you find one particular thing that you're really interested in and you want to pursue that particular specialty, um, then as far as I'm aware, there are lots of opportunities to do that. Um, okay, so if- Yes, yeah, so, sorry, I was just gonna say, I'm, a, I'm, I'm an academic trainee at the moment, so I'm doing some research into kidney cancer. Um, and, I, and I think as Zoe said, there are so many things that you can do with medicine. I would caveat that by saying, I think there are lots of different ways that you can do research. It doesn't necessarily have to be, and that you can still research the human body without doing a medical degree. There are lots of general science degrees from my understanding, um, because medicine is, is, a, is a hard thing to do, but e equally if you decide to do it later in life, there are graduate programs that you can go and do for sure as well. Um, I think it's quite difficult to combine clinical and, and academic training. It adds another dimension to it. And then you're doing a PhD later on in life. Thank you, Alex. Um, okay, so I'll move on to the next question. Um, so, Hamid, you already mentioned why uh, you chose um, your specialty in particular out of all the other specialties. Um, for um, Alex and Zoe, why did you choose your specialties instead of any of the other medical specialties? Uh, I chose histopathology because I enjoyed the problem solving aspect of it, piecing all of the pieces together. And also the fact that we would deal with all subspecialities that the hospital submits samples from. So we have samples from very much the head to the, to the tip of the toes. Uh, so, you know, it's a, a very wide ranging speciality. I enjoyed that the most. It also enabled me to have a work-life balance, um, which you probably told from my talk is quite important to me. I spoke a lot about my children and they kindly helped me with the presentation that I made. Um, so it allows me to have the work-life balance that I really wanted. So, yeah. So I think I, I like the science aspect and the fact that there is space to, like those said, to problem solve, but also, you're not, not you're not busy but you don't tend to have a bleep which is a something which you tend to get contacted on quite frequently so there is space to think and to problem solve and to be methodical um in saying that i think you also have to accept that you will never have your own patients while everything that we do is integral to two patients they're they're somebody else's patients and that's important to consider thank you alex um so another question has come into the Q&A, which is, um, do you work with electron microscopes? 
And what other specialist equipment do you use as a pathologist? Who wants to answer that? I mean, I can start answering about microbiology. Um, so in microbiology, we have um, yeah, different, um, actually, equipment that we use. Um, so we do have actually more machinery um, that we've got. So we've got machines that help us. So I might have shown the um, picture for the Petri dish um, with the bacteria and, and, and fungi growing on. And we do use that Petri dish as well to check for different um, antimicrobials and, and, and see if they are sensitive to, um, if, if, the, if whatever we're growing is sensitive to it or not, just to help us choosing what's the best to treat. But also we've got machinery which can do the same thing. Um, and we even now have like um, robots to help us. So um, in the lab that I worked in the last, we had um, um, a robot which basically takes all the samples and do the culture on the plates and then incubate it um, in a special incubator so it can give the um, different bacteria and um, uh, fungus, fungi, um, the optimum um, conditions to, to grow. And this is all happens automatically. And in the end, it can also tell us which one of these plates is um, growing something and can take pictures of it. And we can see it on the screen. Um, so we use a lot of different um, machines. And I think there's a, a specific question about electron microscopy. So in, in our field, it used to be used quite heavily by um, the virologists mainly in the past to see viruses, because this was one way of um, diagnosing a viral infection. Um, but that has dramatically changed with um, the introduction of the polymerase chain reaction and different tests, um, which use molecular techniques. So we're kind of swayed away from that because it's, a, it's um, electron microscopy is quite labor intensive. Um, and in the context of a clinical laboratory, um, it's really difficult um, you know, to um, justify the time spent when you've got alternative ways of uh, doing the same thing. So, um, but we, we still have an electron microscope um, at work, but it's, I think it's rarely used. Thanks, Ahmed. Um, so, Ian, Alex, did you want to add anything to that? Um, increasingly in histopathology, we are using molecular testing to help pinpoint specific proteins, and um, that can help enhance the treatment and individualize the treatment for individual patients. So that's something that's ever growing in our particular field at the moment. Um, it's offered more in the tertiary centers and as within um, primary care, secondary care, sorry, we are sending our specimens onto particular molecular labs to help identify more individualized treatments for patients. Thank you, Zoe. Um, okay, so I will move on to the next question. Um, what are your biggest tips when going into this sort of career? That's from one of our attendees. What advice would you give to anyone considering a career in pathology? Who wants to kick off? Um, so I think with any medical career, you've got to be prepared to always be learning. Um, work hard, but also with balance, because if you're not looking after yourself, you can't look after your patients, but definitely lifelong learning, I think, and the ability to remain humble and recognise when you could do things better and I guess have, have that kind of approach as well. Thank you, Alex. Um, Zoe Ahmed, do you want to add anything? No, that's fine. Um, uh, I, I kind of agree with with Alex. I think it's um, it's it's um, it's quite important to understand when you do such a career that it's it's quite um, a long journey and um, it's the commitment around it and the perseverance um, and always having um, something else like outside of your career um, to kind of keep you keep your mind you know away from work sometimes i think this is uh, this is my main tip because otherwise you you can easily kind of tip into a, um, a life which is just evolving around your work and, and nothing else so it's, it's keeping something else um, off an interest is very important thank you Ahmed. um i think i'd just like to add to that by saying that pathologists are really friendly people 
and you can get in touch with your pathology um, departments in your local hospitals um, if you want to um, find out a bit more about the careers we've also got a lot on our website um, and I believe that some trusts are um, offering sort of work experience or the opportunity to talk to pathologists so maybe just find out if your local trust is doing anything like that um, and next question is um, would you have any patient interactions or is it all in the labor laboratory? I'm going to start with that one. Yeah, so for, for me, definitely. Um, I mean, I'm not sure if you noticed my background, but I'm actually in a clinic room. Um, so my work is um, it kind of is, is um, partly um, patient facing and partly in the laboratory. Um, and it's yeah that's that's kind of one of the reasons why i enjoy infection because i can get to do both what i like um because i wouldn't want to spend all my time in the lab and at the same time i wouldn't um want just to um not see my patients because it makes such a difference um in the for me in the way we we, we manage them and when i see the patient myself and assess them um so yeah um you can in some areas of pathology um get a bit of both um and sometimes more clinical than laboratory actually in some specialties like hematology for example thank you um there's a question here for you zoe um so they write and um, that you spoke about writing reports from what you observe on the microscope to the doctors. Um, how many different people have to observe the sample? Is there a double checking process of some sort? And what if a mistake is made? So um, as a trainee histopathologist, all of my uh, reports are double checked by a consultant colleague. Um, as a consultant, you frequently consult with each other as well. So if there's any diagnoses that you want to discuss or get a second opinion upon, that is frequently happening. So we've got several consultants in our department. We're always in and out discussing with each other what things are. If a tumour diagnosis or a cancer diagnosis is made, then this is also sent to a multidisciplinary team meeting um, and they are leads, there are leads within the multidisciplinary team who will review the slides as well. So there are lots of checkpoints in which they can be checked. Um, if a mistake is made, then um, that's very rare. We hope that mistakes are not made very often. That will actually be, again, checked with a number of consultant colleagues and if that happens then an error logging is put in and an incident report and then that has to be fully investigated um, and then we have a duty of candor to inform the patient if that's occurred so there are a lot of checks that go on. Thank you Zay. Um, I think this question is for you. Have you already worked with bacteriophages or analysed potential phage therapies? It's a very interesting question. Um, not myself. Um, I'm sure there's a lot of um, um, of that in, in, in the kind of the research field, but in, in the clinical side, um, no, unfortunately not. Um, I haven't personally worked with any phage therapy um, or been involved in any of that research, but I'm sure there are um, a lot of research groups, um, either nationally and internationally, that are exploring that. Um, but yeah, I, as I said, like I, I, I haven't personally been involved, uh, and I'm not aware of any um, like clinical use at the moment and um, outside of research. Thank you, Ahmed. Um, uh, another question: um, Do you work with all age groups? So I suppose that's children and adults. Who wants to answer that one? Alex, should we start with you? Sure. So it, it depends a little bit on where you work, I think, as to how things are, are um, split up. Certainly where I work at the moment, there are specialist pathologists who just do the children, uh, children's samples, and then there are different adult pathologists. But there are some things which, things like um, inflammatory bowel disease, which can be quite specialist. And sometimes people look at those because there can be comparisons between the adult and the children. So it kind of depends, I think, in some places where there might not be a specialist children's pathologist, 
the adult pathologist will look at everything, but sorry, you might know more about that. Thank you. Um, I can also comment on infection. So, I mean, from um, from my point of view, so I, I don't examine um, children because there's a, um, a pediatric infection doctors who can do that. Um, but when it comes to the laboratory work and, and giving advice about treating children with infection, I can still do that, but I, I can't physically see children because um, I'm mainly an, an adult infection doctor. Um, but as an as advice, yes, I know how and we'd get trained on um, giving advice um, about treating um, children with various infections. Thank you, Ahmed. Um, I think we've got time for maybe one, one other question. Um, so a general question for all of you. Um, so this is a two-parter. What is the best part of your job, your job and what is the most challenging part? Zoe, she's tapping me. Uh, the best part of the job uh, for me is knowing that I've helped someone. So even though we don't directly see patients, the fact that I carefully dealt with the specimen, done my very best and actually helped somebody without them even knowing it makes me feel good. The most challenging bit sometimes is time management. Um, we do have a lot of other roles that we also do. So the part that I spoke about is just one part of that. Um, we, we get involved with the multidisciplinary team meetings um, and um, business meetings and audits and things. So trying to juggle that sometimes can be a bit of a challenge, but all of it's very rewarding in its own way. Thanks, so. Alex, how about you? What's the best part and the most challenging part of the job? I would say the best part is the ability to combine research, I think, with it, as, as well as the fact that it's obviously still very important what we're doing. And I think the most challenging part is uncertainty, I would say, in terms of there are always limits to the tests that we have and when you can't find an answer and you can't, you can't help that can be frustrating thank you Alex and Hamlet yeah I, I think I, I agree with um, Alex and Zoe so I think the most interesting part of me is that um, I feel that I've helped someone um, and actually when I'm doing the clinical work seeing them going home and being cured of an infection and um, so that kind of um, drives me um, and the worst part is when you've actually got nothing to do or you, you have no options to treat an infection which um, we can be faced with with, with, with that situation occasionally um, and I can like kind of this feeling um, of helplessness is I think this is the most challenging for me. Thank you Ahmed and um, thank you to all three of you for today. So that brings us to the end of today's event. Um, some really great questions um, from, from our audience, um, so thank you for those. Um, as we mentioned earlier, we do have a lot of information on our website, so um, check out rcpath.org forward slash careers. Um, and um, again, we do have um, other virtual careers events like this, um, where you can hear from other pathologists from um, some of the other specialties as well. So there, there are 17 um, specialties within pathology. Um, so we hope you learned a lot today and um, we look forward to maybe seeing you at one of the other events. Um, have a lovely afternoon, everyone, and enjoy your weekends.